Why? Hello there, everyone. Hello, chat. Thank you for uh, joining us on this lovely Friday for a very interesting new slash special stream. And uh, we're just gonna do a quick audio check. Just make sure levels are fine, you know, that whole thing going on. And um, I mean, I guess I should introduce all the people playing with me. So uh, hi, Xander. Hi, Split. Hey. Hi, Carl. What's going on? Hi. Hello, uh, hello. Uh, you know, the same old, same old. Indeed. But that's right. We have newcomer to the Friday slot. We got Carl here with us. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. He's been dragged in. Yes. Robed so into the proceedings. Aw, you say well, that like it wasn't my choice. Because it wasn't. <laughs> oh, wasn't it? It wasn't. You see, you were kicking and screaming the whole time. I, I figure if it were your we choice, had it would have made it a little easier. Yeah, we had to like... <laughs> Yeah, we had to, like, really just, like, right over the cliff. Push right over. <laughs> For real. Like, I was I was the getaway driver. Fucking don't ask me where I got the van, but Xander was ready to grab her. Like It was, it was my van. He stole it, just so we're all clear. Burlap sack? Hey, I, I, check. Handcuffs? Check. Ropes? Check. We're fucking going. I always have all of those things. <laughs> you never know. Again, what don't ask me why. Nah, I guess this is Stockholm Syndrome then. Yes, apparently. The That's not till World War II. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. Yowchi, yowchi. Get, get absolute bitch smacked with the fucking packs. Well, two very important things right now. First of all, uh, it seems like our audio is indeed Modo hype. Uh, as, <laughs> as the as the as as we say around here. Um uh, second of all, it looks like Atwis, much to our delight, we are pulling good fucking viewership numbers. We got oh. the we are we are pulling some some nice good numbers over here, so that's excellent. Oh. Thank you all for watching. And he also helps Atwis posted a pretty decent hype, like of like what, like of, like uh, seven days ago or like earlier this week. Uh, in, like, something the, like that. Something like that. So yeah, we got some got some good hype. We got a good audience, so you actually get to watch us play a little. Little side game because uh, Call of Cthulhu: Mask and Hotep, or as some might say, Nyarlathotep, uh, uh, is on hiatus right now, and we're just kind of uh, filling in with some new programming, you know, getting some some in, different you know, so. horror going on. If that's in the you words, know, all right. In the words of of the late great John Cleese, he's still alive, but he's an asshole. Um, and now for something completely different. <laughs> all right. And with that, I think I will take you all to the content screen and then we'll go right into it. So I see you guys in a few seconds. Hi everyone. So uh, we are here. We're ready to rumble. Thank you all for joining us today for something, as Andrew said, a little different. And since we're going to hop right into it, I am going to take the time to introduce my lovely cast. So today playing with us, we have Carl. Hello, I'm Carl. Nice to have you here, Carl. We have Xander. Hello, I'm Xander. Thank Although, you. Yeah, yes, I I am Xander. I'm not Lester Goodman wearing Xander's skin. I promise. <laughs> Do not worry about anything. It is all quite fine. Everything's fine. Try not to perceive me. <laughs> God, imagine being perceived. And last, we have Split. Hello. I'm Split. Also not Lester Goodman wearing the skin of Split Guardian. Lester Goodman? I've never heard of him before in my life, though he but sounds like a buddy. very handsome man. Oh, absolutely, completely, upstanding and charming. <laughs> so, 
All things considered, I think we should probably just uh, start off with things. So, as a little intro to chat, Never Going Home is a game that takes place in what you would call a parallel or alternate universe of the one we call our own. In this universe, something happened. During the Battle of the Somme on July 1st, 1916, the amount of death and destruction that occurred within the first minutes and hours of the infamous British charge on the German lines did something. It tore, it pushed, it pulled at the fabric of reality, and it broke it. And something happened. It opened a rift into a world not quite our own. And when that happened, the, the, the energy that came through, first off, screamed, echoed, resonated in the minds of the soldiers within the area, and it did cause casualties. But since then, it sort of um, subsided into what we call whispers. And since then, strange things have been happening. Strange beings have been appearing. Things have been not quite right. Things have been bizarre. And unfortunately, let's just say Brass is far more interested in what's going on than perhaps they should be. So that's our background. Right now, it is the summer of July 1916. The Battle of the Somme is still ongoing. However, there's been there have been developments, there have been things happening, and there's been a plan. There's been a plan put in place by the uh, Allied forces, the French, the British, the Americans actually, who entered the war a little bit sooner, you know, due to the whole veil tearing. And a new technology is being developed that is set to absolutely change the tide of the war, allow people to break through, and finally punch a hole straight through no man's land. Now, we join two of our characters who have been on leave recently. Now, these two characters have been uh, part of a special detail that has been partly, you know, guarding, partly helping test this new technology that's been developed. And so they're coming back fresh off a week's leave from England, and they were waylaid. They were- they received orders to pick up a reporter at, uh, at the train station when they get back and to escort them to the facility where things are being tested. So, um... You know, how about Xander? You should introduce your character first. Sure, I'd be more than happy to. Um, uh, yes. So, uh, I am... Oh, do I know this narratively? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so, yeah, I'll introduce some things. So, I am playing, um, uh, Second Lieutenant Graeme Faulkner, uh, of the Scottish military, one might call it. I don't know the official term for it, but it is, it is the Scottish arm of the the armed British forces. Uh, Graham Faulkner is a 34-year-old man. He is a uh, officer in the war. He is a um, averagely built gentleman. He's about, I'd say, around like 5'11", pushing six foot. Um, he's got the full makings. You know, he's a not, not sturdily built fellow. He's, um, I mean, he's got a little bulk to him from, you know, military training, but he's largely just a pretty average fo uh, fella. Um, kind of like squarish face he's got like a little mustache uh on his upper lip that's you know been trimmed um kind of like you know a, a friendly face but uh wears a kilt obviously like the rest of uh oh naturally oh look up scottish uh uniforms from world war one I. I really hope um, he was uh he had his kilt issued with underwear because not everyone did <laughs> so uh mm. anyway Yes, uh, he does have underwear. I can confirm this. Uh, underwear gate is over. Uh, he does wear underwear. Um, no, so yeah, Graham Faulkner is a Scottish man, uh, second lieutenant in the military. Um, and he has his fair share 
of secrets. Excellent. Mm. In that case, as the uh, the train is pulling into the station, how about a uh, split? You introduce your character. Now, now there is a, a very interesting aspect to introducing this character because the uh, physical physical aspects, other than what I can say, mostly the features. Someone knows more than me. Uh, however. Ah, uh, my, my dear, dear, what most have been calling him a young lad? Ah, uh, Harry Morose, Lance Corporal in the British Royal Forces. Ah, uh, fairly... Not too big, actually. Uh, more around five... Seven, five, eight, I'd say? Uh, what you laughing at? <laughs> rather, rather built due to his training, though seems more on the dexterous side. Uh, more of a runner than a puncher. All Which, right. Yeah. Thank you so much for the introductions. So you two get off the train, and uh, sure enough in uh you know in alignment with the orders and the messages that you received you see i won't call it lost but you see someone who's definitely very out of place there's a man on the platform holding you know a very large camera sort of slung around his neck and he he, he looks like he's craning his head looking for something or someone rather and that would be you know you lot this is the reporter that you've been tasked to escort to the uh, area. All right. Well, off we go then. Oh, um, so uh, you lot are my escort then, yes? Uh, uh, uh Graham Faulkner is in the. He has like a, like one of those like hand rolled cigarettes in his mouth uh, in mouth right now, kind of just like. Uh, smoking one just kind of pulls it from his lips and says, uh, Hey, that we are. You're the one who's, uh, coming over with us? Yes, indeed. That was the, uh, plan. I heard there was something important being developed, and as a result, well, you know, back on the home front, it's good to give everyone a little bit of good news. Um, and hey, you are you're, so uh, oh, sorry. you're American, boy. Uh... No, uh, n not quite. Sorry, the the accent's a, a little lighter than, you know, usual. But uh, that sort of just comes with the business, traveling all over, you know? Fair enough. Uh, Second Lieutenant Graham Faulkner, uh, this is Henry Morose. Oh, right, uh, where are my manners? Uh, Pierce, Mar Marlin, Marlin Pierce, reporter. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Okay, so... Uh as you lot gets get started um you know it's actually probably a good idea to you know enlist quote unquote enlist someone who is uh, i don't know maybe of a lower rank who will you know sort of assist you in terms of escorting this absolute greenhorn through uh the french countryside so you both take a scan, take a look around the platform, and you happen upon a, an American, actually, uh, judging by the uniform. This is a doughboy, you know, practically fresh off the boat. And Carl, how about you introduce your character? So, I'm going to be playing this little squirrely boy. His name is Private Charles McKinley. He actually... Uh, his mother actually grew up in Queens, and so did he for a time before he and his family migrated over to the Americas. And he's, he, he looks like the typical American soldier boy. Like, he's all squirrely eyed and bushy tailed, and he he's looking for glory and adventure. See, and he, he keeps saying doesn't... Queens, and the Queen. New Yorker in me is just like, oh, Queens, New York, where I lived? No, Queens, England. No. 
<laughs> I'm just like, ah, oh, yes. Where is he from? Flushing? Nope. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's um, he he does look like the very typical innocent boy that doesn't quite know what he's getting into. God, indeed. And uh, yeah, sorry. So you uh, enlist enlist this man, and you begin your travels. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves if I as I set some things up. Uh, please do. Um, Lieutenant Fa Oh, we're switching screens. My goodness. Oh. This is how exciting. Um, I want to see everyone's character portrait so bad. Oh, okay. Wait, yeah. oh, you know, I'll, I'll allow you guys to see it, but the stream will oh, have to wait a little bit. As a special bit. treat? As okay, a special treat. Really I, I do you. need to know. <laughs> I've got to know. There he is. There's oh, your boy. For for context, uh, Split allowed me to choose his character portrait. What we've done instead of doing art, because this is a fairly uh, uh, deadly game, is that instead of you know doing hand drawn art, uh, we've gone through you know public domain photographs of people yep. from the area and chosen some of them. So yeah. I think I think after the stream, you should uh, share the uh, character cards to the uh, Discord. Yeah, um, I will. So, I so will. The fans can see. That'd be really cool. Um, hell yeah. Yeah, I think. Okay, cool. Well, then as we uh, as we load it up, like, Graham Faulkner, he's like a he's like a nice guy. He's not like, you know, like, sweet, you know, all the time. But he's like he's one of those like down to earth. Like, if you had to like peg anybody of like actually probably being a hero in like the the traditional sense of he will do the right thing, but he just kind of like looks like a guy. Um, it, it, Graham kind of has that look to him. Um, I think if, 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 remind me what your rank is, Carl. What's Charles's rank? Uh, private. Ah, uh, private. Okay. Uh, so it definitely, what, what are we doing? Are we taking a car? How are we, uh, an automobile? I have How dealt you all, I've dealt you all three cards. These are Ooh. the, uh, cards that you'll have throughout this mission. And the, the yeah. way chat that this works, Never Going Home is a little bit of a different system. We have dice, we have cards. Dice we roll in terms of skill check or skill checks in terms of stuff like that. Now cards, cards are a little different. They kind of represent who you are as a character, your your thoughts, your memories, your values, things like that. And so those are, you know, depending on the suit, we've got, you know, spades for knowledge, clubs for things, hearts for relationships, and diamonds for self. Very nice. Yep, and so as we start off on our journey, we are gonna have a few different things. Now, the way that this works is we our journey is kind of it's sort of a prelude. It's sort of like a a judgment of how things are going in terms of the of, of the unit and stuff like that. And it kind of determines how things are happening uh, or how, how things will shake out. So in order to, so as you travel, as you leave the station, it's still very early and it's highly humid and it's France. You're traveling, you know, mostly, mostly by, mostly by truck, but, uh, or rather lorry or whatever else, but you get off and as you go into the last leg of your journey to the, uh, facility, it, it's by foot. So, mm -hmm. unfortunately, the reporter, uh, Mr. Pierce, he is not exactly, uh, skilled in terms of, or rather well-versed in terms of what it takes to traverse, you know, country I, and i light country. up yeah i light up a cigarette um after hopping off the lorry just kind of like taking it when i you know give um private mckinley a a light slap on the upper arm and i kind of like gesture over at uh our reporter friend and just kind of go uh, help the poor fellow out and uh, grab his bag and make the load easier right sir yes sir <laughs> he just kind of like immediately stands to attention and then like gives it gives a quick um s salute and just goes over to help him with his bags like a good little boy so they make it right over in america so well, yeah they 
Sorry, go ahead. Uh, unfortunately, your travels do take you fairly close to where some of the fighting is happening. Uh, kind of the difficulty in developing weapons is, you know, keeping them close enough to the front lines where they'll be relevant when it eventually comes to deploy them. So, Pierce is doing his best, but he's still a civvy. He's still a civilian. And so, as a result, it's kind of difficult to travel with him. Now, here we come to the requirement of the journey. When it comes to the journey, mm. you all look at your three cards and you decide to choose a card and put it on the board, give it to me. The requirement of the journey to make it through with you know the least amount of hiccups and so on and so forth, I need all red cards from people. All red cards. And your cards, first off, have to stay hidden, but also you can't tell sure. each other what cards you're putting in. You can sort of give vague ideas like, oh, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about this or so on and so forth, but you know, okay. just so uh, when you're ready, take a card, drag it out into the uh, into the playing area, and then I will take them, I will review them, and then I will distribute now, them. Before yeah, before we uh, before we actually do any of that, uh, my question is, um, does the number of the card have any impact on what it does? It does not. If it ever okay. does, cool. I will tell you and I will specify. And all right. Uh, you can add more than one card if you want to, but right. I don't. So think we just we're just gonna point. sure we're just gonna drag our cards from our inventory right onto the board. Yes, sir. All right, can do. Can do. All right, there's mine. Thank you. Hope I'm doing this right. Just mm -hmm. draw the card. Yes, sir. Uh, well, no, you already have well, the card no, in your not from not from the deck. Ah. Yeah, in your card inventory above your above your icon. Ah. I will be taking this one. Hmm. Don't yeah. worry. Right on ahead. Yeah, you just click on the little card icon above your avatar and drag a card from I that see. little window to the play area. <clears throat> well, I put my card down. All right, grab that and uh, split. Boom. Excellent. Let me give give me a moment. Yeah, I gotta take the splits extra card from him. Yeah. Just yeah. Gotta... All right. Okay. Cool. Very good. Very good. Now. All right then. Keep your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so, the way the journey works is that. I will distribute some cards to you, and uh, mm. you will then tell me, in accordance to the sort of legend of what the suits mean, how you answer this question. And the question is, how do you make it back to the base with the reporter while staying undetected? So let me distribute that. Uh, so just to be clear, we are... Um... Our answers are influenced by the card you're about to give us? Yes, indeed. Cool. Good so, to know. Yep. And so, uh, Carl, if you will please take the card that I put up. Oh, boy. Just uh, right-click it and take It's mine now. It is yours. All right. And I believe that was, and correct me if I'm wrong, that would be the two of hearts, yes? Yep. Excellent. I so, hearts represent relationships, things like emotions, things like connections, sort of empathic things that, uh, you know, go on. So, tell me, how do you implement that? How do you use that aspect to sort of make things work? I think. This actually plays really well <clears throat> into what just happened with Charles. Um, I believe he's going to stick to the reporter uh, to the best of his ability, just because he, he's got like a loyalty streak going on. 
and, and and just do do his best to shield the reporter from any oncoming danger and just like first off uh <laughs> you don't get to quote the time that i got shit face drunk in call with you when we were watching 1917 together and playing a drinking game which was called drink every time you we are pretty much sure there's a shot and then you get to the end of it and then you cry. I do because... get to call you out for it because it was a wonderful <laughs> bonding experience. Uh, anyway, I am a, I'm a hard, stoic individual and they're just fucking kids, dude. They're all yeah. kids. Kids, man. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, P Pierce sort of like... You, you know, the reporter appears sort of edges McKinley, uh, sort of nudges McKinley a little with his elbow and just, uh, don't, um, don't worry about it too much. I, um, <clears throat> this is my, um, first time as well. Uh, God. As, um, as Morose is, like, searching the body for, spe like, specifically, like a, like a killing wound or multiple wounds perhaps who knows uh he just shouts back don't worry you get used to it you do oh you certainly do all right i don't know if i find comfort in that all right then uh Morose, you, after a little bit of searching, you indeed find a killing wound, and in the side of the, uh, German, sort of right, right up under the arms, and, uh, it, it goes right in between the ribs, you find a bullet hole. It almost looks like, you know, he might have had his arms up in a rifle position and was shot in the side, and that's what did him in. But, um, more interestingly... It seems like he has a, among his personal effects that you sort of rifle through, he has a sheaf of papers that look oddly familiar. And Lance Corporal Morose, you kind of look through them, and although you can't read German, like some of some of the words and some of the figures seem like they might they might ping something in you, but you're not quite sure um and for any of you uh, if, if you're if you're interested in this i would need a i would need two successes in communication to sort of train the decipher communications. yeah i'm trained in communications um M moroz just kind of as he's squinting at the paper and trying to get it through his head he just uh he looks back and goes, Oi, Lieutenant! Uh, oh, left on it. Uh, it walks up. Um, uh, uh, it takes the papers, scans them over. Um, I feel like he kind of, he kind of looks and he nods and he says, I'm no rudimentary amount of German. Let's see if I can wrap my mind on this one. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll attempt a communications roll. So I just click the little dice icon next to communications. No additional dice, right? I don't, I don't punch any numbers in. Um, or no. you don't have to, but you could if you want. Communication uses smarts, so mm. you could use any of your pool to either add additional dice to roll. You could keep one behind to re-roll however many dice you'd want. Or you could keep a few behind to bump up one of your die values by one to make it a success. Sure, and a remind success me is a that if I six. spend my points, am I lessening from my health pool? No, you are not. So what am I drawing back from when I spend one of those points? Uh, you're you're just for each roll you get a pool of points from your smarts. Oh, yes. so I have a pool of three points per each smarts roll I yes. Do. Yes. I'm going to spend one of those now just for additional dice um, and see if I get anything. So let's All right. spend that. Um, I got one success. Uh, that's a six and a one. Yeah, I'm going to spend one point to re-roll the one die. Okay. Um, and let's see. Because if I hit a five, I can spend that last point to bump it to a six. Yep. Or if I roll a six, I'm gooch, man. <laughs> Fucking gooch. So I just roll a d6? Yep, you roll yeah. 1d6. Motherfucker. 
Um, sure. Fucking you know what? You know what? You know what? Uh, it's uh, that was my second point. I'm gonna spend my third on this roll. <laughs> see if I can to see if I can hit a six. Because mm -hmm. like I mean like I, if I hit a five, fuck it. But like if I hit a six, I mean, it's I'm a fine. One in six chance. Yeah, one in six yeah. chance. Motherfucker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All so right. That's a one success. I catch like a few small words, I imagine, but not enough for the collective whole. Yeah. Well, uh, second lieutenant, uh, second lieutenant. Sorry, excuse me, Thank Faulkner. Thank you. <laughs> you, uh, you look, you look through the sheaf of papers, and you kind of go through, and it kind of looks like, um, I don't know. They were talking about. Th th there are notes about some kind of weaponry, but and you you know there are some drawn diagrams and stuff like that. But when you look at them, they kind of look like I don't know. They they kind of look like what an electrician would use, and you're not an electrician, so you're Lost, not really sure not. what these wire diagrams and these numbers mean. But it's certainly something. So. Great. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I know, what are everyone else's smart scores? <laughs> Not great. <laughs> okay. I've yeah, it, four. if anyone you're else wants to roll smarter, smart. You're, yeah, you're actually smarter than me, Private McKinley, so I catch a few things. I, uh, Graham looks up from his from the papers, uh, looks over at you, McKinley, and kind of like, you know, flags you over to approach from the reporter to get closer. Um, kind of like flags you down. He 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 got he kind of jumps to his feet, um, because because he had ended up. Uh... Sorry, no, he wasn't sitting. What am I thinking? So sorry, he jumps to attention and he runs over, just like yes, sir. Top brass tells me that you uh, speak a little German on your father's side. Well, well, not that much, but. I sure. Can you take a look? Can you take a look at this and see if you can? you know, grasp anything on it. I, I hand Private McKinley the uh, chief of papers. I point out the things I kind of, like, spotted, like, that I picked up on, as few as that were. It's okay. so, like, you know, I mentioned that some's become a weapon, there's a diagram, I point out a couple of the words. Just kind of, like, give my perspective and just, like, help kind of guide him a little bit. Right. Yeah, sure. Um, Private McKinley, uh, you would have to, because of Second Lieutenant Faulkner's help, you would only have to reach a uh, target number of one. So, because you don't have training in communications, you would need to spend one of your points to get the ability to roll, and then you would have the other three points in reserve to either add dice, you know, re-roll the dice if you want to after, or uh, in bump your dice to a, die to a, to a success. Excuse me. Do it. I dice okay. cowards. <laughs> Do it. So he, I'm gonna go ahead and so so there's the one die. Yeah. To actually, so you, roll. you have and your then... pool of four. So you spend one to um to uh, uh to be uh, able have... to roll. Yeah. So then yeah. you can then you have three more points remaining. So how many do you want to spend? You on? have to buy a die. You have to yeah. buy a die for training, and then you have to buy a second die to roll at least once, if that makes sense. Okay. Oh, so you buy the the ability to do it. So you spent two points to do this. Oh, yes. okay, got it. Yeah, have two points. There's remaining. one to do it, and then the other one to. Yeah. Do you want to add a third um, die or save those two points for after the roll? Uh, I'm gonna save that for. For after the roll, cool. so okay, I just hit it twice and then click the dice. Yep. Wait, additional dice. Yeah. yeah no, so, you, sorry, you... sorry. To 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 clarify, um, mm. you buy training and that gives you zero dice to roll, and then you buy a die to roll, so it gives you one die to roll. So you have two left to spend. So, um, you have the one, and then you would roll that, and then... So you're rolling 1d6, right? Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't okay. look at the points as dice. Look at the points yeah. as points. Yeah, okay. Oh. Okay, gotcha. So, uh, and okay, you on. rolled a... You rolled a... F oh, you rolled a, uh... Yeah, you rolled a, a four. four, so... So you could spend those two remaining points to 
make that a success. You can spend one remaining point to use to make oh, it a success. Oh, it's a five or a six. Yep, five or a six is a success. Do it, Private McKinley. Okay, right. let's go. Cool. So, uh, Private McKinley, with sort of the help of Second Lieutenant Faulkner, you sort of look through it and you kind of read through the papers and wait a second this looks kind of it looks almost like they're developing something this looks like the plans for some kind of a weapon or some kind of a some kind of a new technology and uh as you confer with the other two as you confer with faulkner and morose um you two, you realize this seems kind of like plans for what you've been babysitting for the past few weeks. This kind of looks like almost like, you know, something a little too conveniently close to what you've been looking on. It might be that there's a traitor in the group at base who's been feeding information to the enemy. Um, uh, uh, Faulkner puts a new cigarette in his mouth, uh, and anyone who's spent enough time with Faulkner knows that whenever he, like, cranes his head down, puts a cigarette, and lights it, and, like, glances up at people, that's his body language of saying, huddle up real close. Um, uh, so he gives... just gives that like to mckinley as well uh, and he very quietly says as he like there ain't no one tell the reporter keep this under wraps mckinley you didn't understand a fucking word of those papers you understand right sir i understand ready in fact go ahead and give those here no i pass them over discreetly and i look over the report and says you're all good no grenade you can take a picture if you want oh oh um well Good God, it seems rather morbid, doesn't it? As he takes a knee to take a picture. I... <laughs> uh, and yet, yeah, here you are, still taking a photograph. Are you? I mean, well, you're here to capture reality, aren't you? Well, it's, um... Don't... I don't take it the boys back home much appreciate morbidity much uh, so as they prefer uh, heroism, as they call it back on the mainland. Right, and uh, Pier Pierce, Pierce looks a little confused at that, but it. so well, um, they uh, they appreciate our ism. He's dead, ain't he? Died for his country. Yep. You got another one of those? Talking to the the lieutenant. Lieutenant, I pass him a cigarette. Thank you. Hey, so um. We all good? Can we? Fuck you for having a lighter that you're using as a. Pr <laughs> he actually just lit he up. Did. He actually just lit up. This <laughs> fucking legend. <laughs> I've been waiting. Mwah. This fucking legend just lit a fucking spliff on camera. <laughs> you fucking madman. I love this. Nothing. Nothing. All legal. All legal, baby. It's all, all legal. Entirely all legal. legal. All legal. Oh, I love this play, Guardian. I've missed you too much. Um. So yeah, I take a take a smoke and and, and Graham says, um, great. Well, um, uh, artistic integrity aside, shall we uh, keep moving? So we've got a fair amount to hike. Right. Uh, Sounds good right. to me. Great. Okay. All right. Come on, reporter, you can get a uh, plenty wonderful landscaping shots on the way. Um, right. And and Pierce sort of like looks over. The sort of horizon of the French countryside, and while you all are, you know, close enough to the front, you're not, you're not too close. You know, it still looks picturesque. Yeah. It still looks yeah. fairly untouched, all things considered. You're actually far enough away that you don't even hear the omnipresent sound of the shells and the artillery. It's kind of a nice break, but um, Faulkner, by the way, does fully say offhand, like. It kind of like claps um, uh, uh, Marlon on the back and just kind of says, I mean, let's be honest, the war is not going to last forever. And then uh, what? You can uh, 
get some portfolio for a burgeoning career at National Geographic. <laughs> National Geographic. I mean, it's not really my speed, but um, you know what? Yeah, sure. Uh, why not? And Marlon looks a little uncomfortable, but he, you know he'll he'll snap a few shots here and there. I have there. no idea of National Geographic. I'm pretty sure it's an American company. But uh, I'm pretty I, yeah. sure it started in the early 2000s. Yeah, but whatever. Don't worry about uh, it. It's, <laughs> it's fine. We're in fine. an AU, baby. An AU. Don't worry. It, yeah. <laughs> an AU, baby. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Cut loose. Nothing matters. It's an AU, baby. It's an AU, baby. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so... National Geographic's a thing if I say it is. <laughs> Exactly. So in the canon, National Geographic exists. But as you, Woo. as you, I, I don't want to say March because you do have a civvy amongst your mist, yes. uh, among you. But uh, as you travel, something does kind of, and actually, um, Lance Corporal Morose, you're the first one to notice this. Uh, there is something in the tall grass to the side of it. it's not quite a road it's more of like a trail but uh something rustles in the sort of tall grass to your right it's a little too close for comfort uh morose immediately hand directly onto the uh graham's chest other hand going directly down to his sidearm what do you got Oh, grass. Just go okay. off the way. Uh, I would like to. Can I tell if that's an animal or not? Yeah, sure. Um, give me an investigation roll, target number one. So you just need one success. Uh, okay. Um, this is, I'm not trained in this, so I spend one of my five points and guts. <laughs> uh, to be trained in it. Spend a second for a die. I'll spend a third for an additional die. Okay. Once one success. All right. Uh, you know, excellent. So you sort of you sort of pause. You sort of like squint through the grass, and you take a moment to think about it. And you take in the smell, and it smells like carrion. You smell the buzzing of. You hear the buzzing of flies, and you smell rotting flesh, but it doesn't seem like this is an animal. There aren't really any... No, this is not an animal. This is not an animal at all. And as you come to this deduction, there's a pause in the rustle. It stops. And there is just a brief moment where it's entirely silent. And then, coming th coming through the grass, there's something unnatural, something disgusting. And if you took part in the Battle of the Somme, maybe you've seen one of these before, but maybe not. For example, well, Private McKinley, and definitely for the reporter, this is the first time you've seen something like this. This is a corpse eater. A corpse feeder, and it has been feasting on the bloated corpse of a dead soldier. And actually, there's not just one, there are two of them. And as they lope out of the tall grass, we're in combat now, baby. Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, boy! So let's fucking go! All right. Oh, God. So. Oh, boy. I'm ready. I'm ready to die. All right, now, tell us, tell us, Game Master. The way combat works is it works on an initiative system of a kind. Now, the person who has the highest face card gets to go first. You don't have to show your face card, but uh, if you think you got a good one, go right ahead. I mean... <laughs> I got one moments ago, so True. I'll happily throw down my um, king of uh, uh, king of diamonds, which I do 
realize realize that it was diamonds. I said a heart earlier, but it it was in fact king of diamonds. It was. That's fine. Which, I mean, that still works though. That that still works though because like uh, uh, diamonds is like ambition and hope. And that still absolutely plays into mm-hmm. everything I said. So that's totally fine. Uh, yeah, I'll throw down my. Do I just drop it onto the board here? Uh, no, that's fine. You can just tell me what you have, and that's okay. totally cool. Got a ki- got a king of diamonds. All right. In that case, you absolutely uh, beat the initiative of the corpse feeder, or the ghoul, or the ghouls rather, because there are two of them, and you do get to go first, unless somebody has an ace and they want to use that. Nope. No. Cool. Nope. Ah. Cool. Uh, great. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I um in a in a moment of like that might be surprising for like McKinley or the reporter to see. I feel like Morose has probably seen this before though. Like fucking listen, Graham has, is a, is a very down to earth kind of guy, very insightful in a very emotional way, but he is also an extremely and terrifyingly quick draw with his service firearm. Um, so just as soon as like, he's got the cigarette like hanging out of his mouth immediately as he's corpse shamble out, uh, gun whips into his hand before Moroz can even think about pulling his gun from its holster and just begins to fire shots. Um, Excellent. Make me a ranged roll, please. And you are going to want I, a, to reach a target number of three. Or, sorry, sorry. Cool. Not, not, yeah, three, three, three. I'll need three successes? Correct. Okay, cool. So I have a five in guts. I'm already trained in this, so I have a full five points of guts to spend on my range attack. So I'm going to spend one of those uh, for a, an additional die uh, for sure. Um, they'll give me four. Further, my friend. Sure, absolutely. So that's one. That's one success. I rolled a six and a four. Spend one success to make that a second success. So I'll have two successes. Okay. So I have three points remaining. Um, and I will... Okay, cool. So how can I spend my dice? Because I have, I have three points remaining. Um... And I have two successes so far. Okay. Um, uh, you, all right. Generally, and I'm sorry I didn't make this clearer earlier. Generally, sure. you can only add dice uh, before you roll and you can't add them afterwards. But because uh, I didn't okay. make that clear, you can go ahead and uh, use your So I'll spend another one to say that I have a third. Sure, cool. Yeah, okay, cool. So then I'll say that I'll spend one more po- point for an extra die in that pool. Uh, so that's a four. I will spend another point to make that a success. So I have three successes on my range attack roll. Excellent. Very good. And that is most absolutely a hit. And I think you mentioned you had a pistol, yes? Service firearm. I mean, it's quicker to grab than, like, say, a rifle. Yeah. Um, to just, like, whip that out and just fire bo- at both corpse eaters. Cool. So, uh, with with the pistol, you manage to hit one of them, and it sort of it, it takes the shot in in the shoulder, and it sort of jerks backwards, and it looks like you've done fairly significant damage to it. Um, in the, I'll I'll show this to you all. The uh, combat mm. tab. Uh, if you scroll down, it shows the weapons and what they do. But it looks oh, like you've great. done yeah, cool. significant damage to one of them, so it has taken two damage. And it's just, I'm just using a pistol. Hell yeah. So, now... Um, no, wait, sorry. hold on. One second. I'm just curious because I want to have a question. Mm-hmm. So, with the pistol, it says critical three in parentheses. What does that mean? Uh, That means you would need additional successes over the base successes to hit in order to activate that sort of special effect. Good to know. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, you do two damage to one of the corpse eaters, and now the way initiative works in this game is that everyone picks who goes after them, and so what that means is that okay, eventually somebody is going to have to pick the enemies to go, which will be oh, quite interesting. So, uh, yeah, yeah. go ahead, I'm second going... lieutenant. Because we already established in the narrative that Harry already had his hand on his gun, I'm going to pick Harry as a, my immediate follow-up to draw and shoot and fight these guys. So, yeah. Okay, Mr. Morose, uh, what do you want to do? All right, so... Uh, first, I have a question for you, the DM. Uh, in, in that span of time in which the lieutenant made his opening attack, how, do you think... 
my my man would have enough time to reach for the rifle strapped to his shoulder or do you think this would be a little too quick of a timing oh no you 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 would absolutely have time you were still on edge and you know you're a trained soldier you've got you've got time and room to reach for your rifle all right then he he goes ahead whilst the uh other officer goes ahead and opens fire he's going to take the moment of chaos and confusion to take the rifle that strapped over his shoulder down his trusty lee enfield and take fire which which one are you firing at the injured one or the uninjured one the uninjured one I'd all say. right cool so uh you're gonna have to hit a target number of three please roll me that range roll all righty I have four guts. Yeah, and uh, please remember, if you want to add dice to it, you got to do it now. Yeah. Two more dice. Two. Okay. That leaves you two in reserve. Oh. All right. There we go. Excellent. You hit that three. So, and a rifle does two damage, I believe. So you take quick aim at the uninjured run and uh, uninjured one, and you fire off a quick shot and it hits very well and you've done two damage to it and it is not looking very good. It sort of hisses at you and the two of them continue to sort of shamble forward. Now, who do you want to go next? Uh, I'm not gonna ask for specific stats, because uh, I don't want to do that, but Carl, in this exact moment, how's McKinley looking? He's scared to death, but looks like he's ready to either run or hide. Poor guy. <laughs> ah. Eh. And- there's uh there's Cause the reporter he is with the re- He is with the reporter right now and he he's been his lapdog the entire time, so <laughs> The reporter looks frozen in his fucking tracks. Like the these these things and I, and I don't think I was clear enough in describing, but these corpse feeders, these ghouls, they are definitely not human they're absolutely unnatural their teeth are jagged they have crusted dried black and brown blood that sort of covers their mouth and chest they don't wear clothing and they are they're they're not natural they're definitely not anything that anyone has ever seen unless you are unfortunate enough to you know be privy to when the veil tore so the reporter's kind of uh paralyzed in fear right now uh, Hard. uh this is me what saying is- that the reporter is not gonna join combat yeah fuck i'm i'm caught between two things but Strategy brains thinking one way. McKinley, take your gun out. Oh boy. <laughs> All right, so, private. So, McKinley froze initially when when he saw you know the the two monstrosities pop up, and unfortunately. His first instinct is not to go for his gun, but to try and tackle the reporter and just kind of roll with him into the grass <laughs> to, to to kind of hide and, and just stay hidden. Okay, um, you know, give me an, give me an athletics roll. I uh, will say it's a target number one to uh, sort of knock the reporter out of the way and make sure he stays out of danger. Ah, uh, Dagnabbit, I can't use stealth. 
<laughs> no, you can't. You're knocking God, him sorry. over. Go You're tackling him. It. You're tackling him, man. Okay. Okay, one to roll, and then I'm just going to go all in here. All right. Because he, he's in a panic. So one, and then two additional dice. So that's the whole thing. All right. One success. Hey. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Very nice. The poor, poor reporter. He kind <laughs> of, he kind of like partially in his shock. His like first instant, his first instinct is sort of was sort of to like raise his camera up halfway, but then he like kind of froze, and then you just fucking tackled Mr. Pierce uh, to the ground. <laughs> he is on the floor. He is. He, he he kind of made a little grunt of pain. He didn't injure him too badly, but uh, it looks like he got the fucking message. So he's <laughs> effectively out of the combat, and he will run as soon as he gets the opportunity to. So then, Private McKinley, I think next you have to choose one of the corpse feeders, don't you? Oh, you boy. have to choose the corpse feeders, both of them. I have them grouped. Mm together I hey, it, so i can't choose the injured one <laughs> no hey, man. i mean they're both at least, injured at least you have both morose and myself closest to them so oh, boy. You know. <laughs> okay i guess we're choosing the corpse <laughs> all right uh the the first corpse feeder sort of like it sort of like rears up a little bit and its head like flops over to the side to the side and it makes just this inhuman, disgusting kind of cross between a hiss and a growl. Just <laughs> and it makes an attack against Yeah, we'll we'll say it makes an attack against second lieutenant second lieutenant pardon Faulkner. We so... speak the Queen's English in here. Uh... <laughs> All right. Uh... So let let me get a moment to do that and yeah. we'll roll a two d six. So I'm going to assume that this is going to be a physical attack against, like it's going against my my. Yes, my, my it is health. going against your brawn. Oh, I'm probably gonna die. <laughs> oh no! I uh, don't say that. Die. Oh, so it's a two and a five, which is one success which is what's your brawn two uh one success does not meet two successes so it does not hit you it sort of lunges forward it's disgusting oh, it's disgusting sort of hands claws raking the air but you sort of backpedal and uh it oh okay misses. just so i'm establishing so they need so in order for an enemy to hit you they need to roll number of successes equal to or higher than your current points in that uh 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 pool correct love that for me mm -hmm. all right now uh the other one sort of uh sees its compatriot its ally lunge forward and instead of going for a physical attack it turns towards lance corporal morose and it makes a special attack. Now this attack, instead of targeting brawn, which is your physical self, it targets guts. It emits this sort of high-pitched, resonating laughter. And uh, this is a guts attack, so it will roll a 4d6, and we'll see how that oh, goes. God. So, no, no successes. successes. No successes at all. You are safe. Woo! <sighs> the most Woo! it could have done was match me. What <laughs> happens if they match me? Um, If they match you, they still do the damage. Yeah. Gotcha. So, it, it attempted its uh, attack, but it didn't quite work out. So, I am going to choose Private McKinley to go next. All right. <laughs> so he is currently on top of this reporter. 
is it plausible for him to pull out a pistol and try to aim at one of the monstrosities? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, pull out your pistol and make me a ranged attack, please. And okay. you're going to have to hit a target number of one because they were previously injured by your two other companions. Okay. And I am not proficient in range, so that's one guy's gone. And let's go all in, shall we? Yeah. One nice. success. <laughs> you whip out your service pistol and with a shot powered by adrenaline and fear and what the fuck? fuck is this you nail one right in the forehead its head snaps back and it slowly falls backwards and falls into the grass you've killed one of them <laughs> Excellent. all right who goes next yeah. um charles finding his voice kind of squeaks and goes Sir! Sir, um, what have your name? Shoot, one second. <laughs> I forgot his name. In the heat of battle, things get difficult. <laughs> He's freaking we... out, man. This is first encounter with the supernatural. He did just meet us. <laughs> he goes, Sir, Rose, can you get me other one? And then he just falls silent after that. All right. Lance Corporal Morose. Hell of a shot, Greenhorn! <laughs> Fire. <laughs> Kerblam! Make me a ranged roll, please. Absolutely. You've got it. Now, just as a reminder, your points refresh, correct? Yes, correct. Cool, Excellent. I'm going to do the same thing I did last time. There you go. You met it, and with just supreme efficiency and coolness, you shoulder your rifle, you take the shot, and the second corpse feeder falls dead. And, uh, that's Falker that. immediately looks over his shoulder at the reporter, and with a cigarette in his mouth, uh, uh, he says, like I said, unnatural. No. <laughs> What, what was, what was, and, you know, Pierce sort of, like, brushes himself off and sort of gets up out of the dust and in the dirt and just, what are those? And he sort of, like, kind of hesitantly lifts up his camera as if to take a picture. Um, Falconer looks over at Morose and says, what do we think? Standard corpse eater? I'd say standard, if not. And he gives it a gentle, like, nudge with his foot. Smaller than usual. They've been getting more persistent since the psalm. They're making it further across the border. Mm. I. So. I've got a question. Would, would common knowledge. Uh, sorry, sorry, out of character. Mm -hmm. Would the corpse eaters be common knowledge within the army or would no. it be not no at all. not at all you've never heard of this at all whatsoever news of the joking. supernatural things <laughs> no no oh boy okay that's good to know mm -hmm. uh yeah Faulkner like just like kind of like gives um um a, like a nod over at morose and i feel like there's this unspoken agreement and he hands him um his lit cigarette and also just passes him his flask of uh, uh, of whiskey and just nods over at the two corpse eaters like you know what to do uh and then he turns over and like walks over towards the reporter and mckinley um and he says and he looks at the camera and he says you're not going to take pictures and all those no. Uh, and the reporter sort of looks 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 the lieutenant up and down and uh hmm actually make me a make me a communications roll just a just a target number of one sure I'll add an extra dice to that 
One success. Right. Um, it's just, uh, the reporter sort of, like, looks out at the camera and lowers it, and he kind of looks over to the, the corpse eaters and just, they just, um, uh, just, it's just people have gone mad, right? I just... put a hand on his shoulder, and I look him in the eyes, and I say, no. And the reason they're not going to take pictures, it's not because of some bloated military classified hush hush sure there are some of the higher brass that encourage that sort of behavior but where i operate from is what you are now experiencing and feeling is not something that anybody outside of this war needs to ever know about people that are beyond the reach of this war live a life blissfully unaware that things like this exist. I am very sorry that you're now aware that there are unnatural things lurking at the fringes of this war. But you know now, and you have a duty. A duty to make sure that no other people kind of like taps him on his chest. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. I, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, he lets the camera hang and he just sort of like he sort of like raises his hands and he takes a few steps back. He takes more than a few steps back. He kind of like puts some significant distance between himself and you all and just I no, I um I understand. Um uh let's uh Right. Let's keep going, I guess. Yep. McKinley, you need a moment? I suppose so. He, he's just kind of sitting there w w with his jaw wide open. He he is shaking a little bit from the adre coming back down from the adrenaline of what just happened, and he's just kind of eyeing the the uh, the corpses that are lying there and just trying to understand what the hell he's seeing. Yeah, I, as he's doing that, uh, Harry from. The point of being directly next to the corpse eaters, fixing to do what it is that he was just told you know how to do, uh, looks over at McKinley, listening to the whole conversation, seeing the poor Greenhorns, poor American's face just pale white, and his rifle pressed the butt of his rifle pressed against his hip, barrel to the sky, slightly ajar, kicks the one that McKinley shot across the head. Hell of a shot, Greenhorn. Good. Pretty good. The the praise kind of snaps him out of it. He goes, uh, y Yes, sir. Th thank you. I, I, I don't <laughs> know you. how I did it. Well, you aimed and you fired, and that seemed to do the trick. So just uh, remember, one between the old noggin and uh, another for safekeeping, so. Uh, right. Y yes, sir. I'll remember that, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pat McKinley on the arm and say, just remember, there are worse things than these two out there, so just, uh, you got to be ready. And uh, best advice I can offer you, uh, Keep your pecker hard and your powder dry. And the uh, <laughs> world will turn. He just like slowly gnaws as his his, his face turns a, a little bit pale again at the thought mm. there's worse stuff out there. And then he just like slowly nods. <laughs> I like that one, Lieutenant. I might keep that. Thank you. I got it from a movie that hasn't come out yet. <laughs> <laughs> Platoon, great film. Charlie. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, All right. Yeah, Keep your okay. secrets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep your pecker hard and your powder dry, and the world will turn. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Congratulations at overcoming your first threat. Now, Woo! as a reward for defeating the corpse feeders, the corpse eaters, everyone except you split because you already drew one. 
everyone gets to draw a card. At least you already drew yours is. earlier, so you get to keep <laughs> that. But uh, both of you can draw one. Take it. I'm down. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> oh. Okay. And oh, boy. Uh, as you travel, and God, finally, thank God, you managed to make it to the base where the weaponry has been being developed. It's kind of a sort of out of the way kind of warehouse uh, sort of in the middle of the woods and the fields the countryside of France and both you Faulkner and you Morose this is the place that you've been spending the past few weeks and god does it look great and congratulations for making it here for coming back for managing to escort this greenhorn and this reporter through, you know, enemy territory, everyone gets to draw another card. Oh, fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I get to draw this one. Hell yeah. Yeah! <laughs> Alright. <Whoa. laughs> and, uh, with that, I think this is a pretty good time to go on break. What do you guys think? I think this is a great time to go on break. I'm down. Oh, yeah. All right. I need so... to refill my glass. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, <laughs> chat, we'll be back in, you know, about 15 ish minutes and we will great. catch you then. See ya. Why? Uh, Welcome back. We had a nice break and we just got back to the facility where weapons are being developed and I think it's time to go. What do you guys think? I I concur. I wholly concur. All right. So you managed to make it to the facility and uh honestly the traveling took you the majority of the day. So after hitting the hay and after taking some and after taking some time to uh, rest and recuperate it's a brand new day and uh your co has unfortunately or you know fortunately asked you to give the reporter a tour of the project and to showcase you know the advances that are happening the technology that is going ahead and exactly what has been going into the work on the very first tanks that have ever existed in the uh, world before mm -hmm. we do any of that real quick my question is who is like the commanding officer here all right your commanding officer like who's in charge of the project here your commanding officer is a very tired very stressed englishman major evans he has been in charge of managing the personnel around the uh the operation sure. for the entire time he's not necessarily the sure. technical um, person but he manages like everyone around uh real quick uh graham walks up to uh private mckinley um says a lot uh, can you help the reporter um get his blog uh just kind of like just stall. Can you stall for a little bit? Oh, right. Right, so, of course. I, okay, thank you. He, he seems like he wants to ask more, but he, he bites his tongue. <laughs> Gives him a swift pat on the shoulder. It, good lad. All right, thank you. Uh, Moros, can I speak to you over here? Right, so... You got those papers? Of course I do. We're doing what we think. Yeah. Can you hand them over? Thank you, you are. Take them. Uh, look at him and I say, uh, you can come with me if you want, but uh, otherwise, you're welcome to stay here with uh, McKinley and that uh, Greenhorn and just kind of prevent him from wandering for a bit longer until I can uh, talk to Evans about what we found. Well, as much as I would love to be in the deeply stressful situation that you're about to plunge straight forth into. I think I'd be a little more effective in keeping the uh, reporter off of anything that they should not see. Fair enough. I'll take one for the team, as it were. Ah, uh, that's what I like to hear. Thank Smoke you, me, Kipper. I'll be back by breakfast. Pat him on the arm. 
Uh, <laughs> See you soon, my friend. Yeah, I'm gonna go find Evans. All right. Uh, second Lieutenant, you find Evans, who is appears to be in the middle of doing a bunch of administrative work in sort of like the main sort of office area of like the main warehouse. He he sort of like casts you like he hears the door open. He casts you a glance, looks back down at his paper, sighs, and then sort of like rolls his shoulders and looks back up at you. It looks like he hasn't slept in two days. I'm saluting. Right, right. At ease, at ease, at ease. <clears throat> uh, Morden, Evans. Um, I hate to complicate your currently uh, loaded amount of work at the moment, but unfortunately we have some uh, troubling business to discuss. I've been sort of like nods, pinches his brow, and just sort of like slides his chair back from what the ca- what kind of stretches. office does evans have like is it like a like a, an office with like windows or it's not even really an all o- it, it looks like it might have been like kind of a a sort of common area for workers kind of before the war who were working mm. in this uh in this warehouse but it's more along the lines of there are a few windows and there are a number of desks and major evans uh. is at one of them Oh, so there are more people in here, or no? Uh, no, it's it's still fairly early, so you've caught yeah. him alone. I I draw the blinds. I, put, like, just put a lock on, like, I just lock the door for a second. I walk over to his desk and, you know, cigarette in my mouth. I place the papers in front of him. Um, and, uh, I say that was a, uh, kraut, a, on our side of the lines, dead. Looks like he may have been shot. Had these on him. Luckily, one of our uh, privates uh, can speak a bit of uh, German. It looks like uh, this is a German report on all that we've been working on here. Right, right. Hold on. And Ev- Evan sort of like takes takes the papers and leafs through them a little bit and sort of like blinks and shakes his head and just sort of pauses, goes back to the front, flips to them again, and then looks you dead in the eye and just... Does anyone else know? Only my team, sir. Right. Right. And I can (sighs) promise you that no one in my team is a mole. He kind of he kind of looks you up and down, and you've worked with him long enough, and he's worked with you long enough that he kind of he knows you're sort of on the level, and so Major Evans sort of like slowly nods and just leans back in his chair, and then sort of slumps forward again. Hmm. Well, well, well. That is just. I know I shouldn't be surprised. It's uh, frankly kind of. No, it, it's good that we've gotten along so far, and listen, and it looks like he's cut himself off in the middle of the train of thought, and he looks back up at you, uh, Second Lieutenant Faulkner, and he just says, All right, what I need you to do is I need you to carry on, carry on as if everything is normal. Don't uh, breathe a word to the rest of the company, to the rest of the detail, nothing. I just want you to continue following the orders. Give the reporter a tour. Give, give you know, give him the demonstration of what we've been working on, and um, maybe just sort of uh, take the time to keep an eye on a few things, you and the rest of your men. And um, listen, I I know I know the tests have been a little dodgy recently. However, while you lot have been gone the past week, we've done a a bunch of refinements, so I think you and the lads will have- we'll, f- we'll find it more to your liking. Alright? Ears open. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, well, uh, mum's the word on mm-hmm. this subject in particular. Uh, that said, uh, surprise it took us this long. Um, show myself out of the office. 
It sounds good. So... I'll head back to my group and just kind of like saunter over to the group and go, all right, who's ready for the tour? <laughs> oh, um, tour? Sure. Um, uh, Pierce sort of looks down at his camera, looks back up. I, I'm allowed to take pictures, yes? Until I say you aren't. Right. And he sort of pales a little. Right. Yes. Uh, of course. So, yeah. Um, let's, uh, let's get to it then. Uh, chin up! And he slaps the, the reporter on the, <laughs> on the shoulder. <clears throat> yeah. 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 No. Uh, chin up. That's right. Uh, thank you. That's Corporal. <laughs> he sort of gives a little nervous laugh. <laughs> All right. Ah. Uh. I don't remember being like him, don't you, Lieutenant? Eh, uh, long time ago, Moros. <laughs> You'll find this, at least here, a lot more, uh... And he reaches an arm around the, the shoulder of the reporter. Comfortable. Uh, Private McKinley, you wanted to say something? And, right, so so he he's kind of like sitting there biting his tongue the whole time, but he he keeps taking glances at um, uh, Faulkner, and he um, he he says, S "Sorry, sir. I I hope I'm not speaking out, sir." But speak freely, private. R right, sir. Um, I are, are you sure I'm supposed to be? going for a, a, a tour. Uh, sh shouldn't I be going to my barracks? You're in my squad, aren't you? R right. That that I am, I, I suppose. Then have I given you your orders to return to your barracks yet? No, no, sir. And I suppose by an extreme technicality your orders are to embark on a tour. Uh, Different different armies be damned. You're with me, I'm with you. And, uh... Why are you saying you... Would you like to be dismissed to your barracks? Oh, no, no sir. I, I wasn't trying to imply that, sir. Get your shit just... together. Come on, then. Let's go. Right. Right. Thank you, sir. I may have to take back what I said earlier. Perhaps the Americans didn't build them right. <laughs> uh, 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 uh... <laughs> <laughs> Faulkner's eyebrows go up and he kind of chuckles, but then he looks at McKinley and says, then they take him too seriously, lad. He uh, means it in a... Uh, he means it positively, even if he doesn't sound like it's not... Like, even if he doesn't sound like it half the time. He, he nods. He's like trying to hide his smirk as, as he looks towards um, McKinley. Sorry. Uh... Faulkner? Yeah. There you go, you got it. Um, he goes, All right. I, I need to have the list up. <laughs> have we eaten yet? Did we eat yet? Or no? What is food? I don't think I know what that is. Ah, uh, yes, Morose. You're, you're all whiskey and cigarettes half the time. <laughs> uh, I keeps am, me going. It's a miracle that you haven't set yourself ablaze yet for the number of corpses you've burned. All right, well, let's get to it then. Uh, you follow, and uh, we have our orders to take you on a tour. So uh, take photographs, and if you take photographs of something that you're not supposed to take a photograph of, um, we'll let you know. And trust me, you'll I'll know. know. Uh, right. Uh, just uh, maybe let me know beforehand so I don't have to scrap the entire roll of film, yes? I will let you know in advance, lad. I'm not one in the business of wasting your time. Right. Um, thank you. All right. Mm. So, uh, out of character, luckily, so your, your path to sort of get to this, uh, to get to the facility, it is closer to the front lines. So it, it, you kind of took like an arcing path, like through the countryside mm. and sort of up towards the front lines. So, um... Luckily, you're still far enough behind that, you know, you got enough supplies. Like, the supply train isn't too far behind. So, you know, food was pretty easily obtained and so on and so forth. Like, yeah. getting breakfast wasn't too much of an issue. So, 
you all go forth and you take Marlon Pierce throughout the uh, through the facility and you give him the first gander of the tanks that have been in development and we have gone back to another journey phase now like I said and as a reminder to everyone in the chat the journey phase kind of uh sort of exemplifies the feelings and the general vibes of the detail and the people around so for this journey I want to see the requirement to succeed is I want one card of each suit and keep in mind you can put in more than one card if you'd like but uh you don't necessarily have to so uh please okay. make your choices drag them up and i will grab them and for myself. we can't communicate in no. advance uh you you so. can sort of uh you can sort of talk amongst yourselves in character vaguely but no you cannot show your cards you cannot say oh i'm putting down a club in a spade you can't do that oh can we uh can uh, we uh, here's here's, a, so here's we can, an interesting idea okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. Uh, talking about it like we're playing a game of poker. That's 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 exactly a little true. I was gonna say like so we can possibly allude to what we might want to include, but we can't just outright say I'm picking a diamond. Mm -hmm. You know, like okay, cool. But I feel like, and I'm gonna say this so coyly, but without breaking the rules of the game. I think Graham Faulkner is a man of parables and uh, a man who likes to tell uh, uh, wise tales. That's how I'm going to hint at what I'm applying to my thing. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. <sighs> well, I'll say that... Uh... Harry is a man of the queen, and he knows both her love and her ire. Let's see. Sorry, I've got to think about this. <laughs> You're good. You, you better drag those cards up, up for me to take split, or so help me. <laughs> Hold on. I didn't see any other cards up for you some know, reason in my monkey you can brain. Take, I was like, you can take cards from other people's decks. You can, but that's not something that oh, fair. is a thing for this game in particular. Sure. It's less fun. You you do have to put in your own cards. So well, what Charles is going to say. He, he's going to sort of mention offhandedly to the to the reporter. Well, so me, me mom has always said that I've, I've thought uh, a lot of feelings for, for a lad, I, I suppose. But, um, my, my father has always said I I suppose I had one too too much for um, feelings in his opinion. That that is before he passed. Oh, well, um, sorry to hear that. Well, I can't imagine this whole. Uh... I... Sorry, God. No, finish off. I'm thinking. Yeah. Um. Well, I'm. I can't imagine that this whole uh, business is um easy. For you, I know it isn't for me, and it seems like we're both uh, more sensitive sorts. Not that there's any issue with that, just sort of a, um... I'm going to be honest with you, Reverend McKinley, I'm a little... I'm a little... I'm a little nervous, considering, you know, what we encountered yesterday, and also how close we are to the front. I, um... I know I'll be safe with you all, but it's just, uh... It, it's, it's more than I expected, it's more than we hear back about at home uh, hey 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 gm mm. i'm feeling nervous about how we stand right now in the collective of what we're playing can i add two more cards 
Sure, you can absolutely add two more cards if you'd like. I would, because I'm nervous we're not going to have enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I'm playing... Okay. Before, before you do... Can I can I get are are we allowed to get hints on what these cards are before he plays them? Uh yeah. Uh one is insurance because I feel like from the vibe we had so far was like I don't feel like anyone played a card that fits under this domain from what was mentioned out loud, so I'm playing this one for sure. The other one is a if we have anything missing, this one will cover it. Okay, I'll trust you. All right. You're a very uh, smart man, Lee. Don't Tenet. mind losing some cards, but at the same time, I'd rather succeed at this and then fail elsewhere. <laughs> I, I was going to say, because I... Uh, <clears throat> All right. So, uh, Private, you still have not added a card to the pile. You actually have to throw it on. Yeah, Carl, you gotta click and drag your uh, thing to the top. Oh no, oh no, I did. Oh, okay. Did Excellent. So... Okay. Alright. So nice. I am going to deal some out then. Okay. Interesting. Um, before we go, uh, I just want to get this up front. What did you want to uh, use that card as? Xander. Um things. Um clubs. Okay. Cool. Good to know. In uh in that case. So <laughs> I will say oh, did, you and, uh, did you put down clubs? I did not, but I could Okay. Okay. That's fine. That's uh why, give me a moment. That's why so... I covered it. So I covered it. I was like, I don't feel like anyone's put down clubs. So we will put down the first card, and that would be the Black Joker, which is a clubs card. So, you know, I think I'll give it back to Xander. Uh, oh, you can take it me. and let me know uh, how exactly you use that clubs card to, uh, how do I say, uh, what... How do you sort of spin this technology? How do you sort of impress upon the reporter its usefulness, its, you know, the, how important it is uh, when it comes to why you've been working on it and what it'll mean for people both on the front and back home? Um, so the club's card, for those of you watching at home, is a a things thing uh it involves action adventure overcoming obstacles so i think though this thing is it is a very impressive thing to look at one that evokes a sense of holy shit that's cool to look at but also it is really like terrain navigating like you know how you have a lot of like tanks that can like climb over like intense things this is like really designed to like maneuver in like any terrain so it's really good at overcoming obstacles all right Wow, yeah, uh, no, it's, uh, absolutely very, you know, Pierce looks it up and down, very impressive, the, uh, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this before, I mean, it's, it's massive, and he sort of, like, takes a, takes his camera out, takes a few pictures of, like, the caterpillar treads, of the, the armored plating, and everything like that. Now, because... Xander put in the Black Joker. The Joker is an interesting card because it means you can use it as any other card. It's a wild card, so to speak. But uh, the Black Joker in particular, if you play it, it means you have a chance to draw for corruption. So Xander, if you wouldn't mind drawing a single card from the deck. Sure. Cool. I take it. Yep, just take it. And uh, okay. if you don't mind, well, I'm I'm gonna steal it. So. Okay. Uh, interesting. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. And I I think I sent you. Yep, 
I, I, I sent you more information about this, but we will uh, we will let that be for now. Cool. So uh, let me just do a little thing right here. Cool. Well, that's sorted, and uh, you can you can go ahead and take the card that's on the table right now. Okay, I can. That take is that? yours. Okay, cool. Yep. Uh, quick question, by the way, uh, about I remember I was saying this in the in the cards thing. Uh, with um, after a Joker is played, um, I believe it says we res did we re we reshuffle the deck, including the Joker. Do do we? I I would have to double. Yep, check it's under that using over. cards under the description for Jokers. After a Joker okay. is played or revealed for any reason, reshuffle the deck, including the Joker. Um. All right, that's fine. Uh, just slap your Joker on there, and yep. I will. Uh, I will take care of that. Yes. Don't want to break the rules or anything. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And shuffled. Excellent. Right. So next up, I want. Uh, right. Uh, Private McKinley, if you will take that card, please. Okie dokie. Doke. And uh, if you don't mind, what is it? It is a. It's a ten of clubs. Clubs? Wait, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, clubs. Spades, you mean? Spades. Oh, I'm dumb. All right. <laughs> ten of spades. Excellent. So, uh. <laughs> The pointy one. <laughs> yes, the pointy one. In that case, spades, that would be knowledge. So tell me how would how you would use that to sort of answer the question of impressing on the reporter why you think this uh, sort of development is uh, vital to the war effort. Let's see. Can I explain in character or out of character? Either way is fine. Oh, so you see. And, and so, so he's like he's talking to the reporter, and the topic switches over to this this powerful thing, and he's like, "Well, you see, sir, I I I believe with something like this, we could have a huge advantage over the enemy, and we'd be able to end this war quicker." Right, right, of course. Um, and I mean, you know, the the quicker the better. The aim is to have you boys back home by Christmas, right? I mean, yeah, at least. I'd yeah. love to go home by Christmas, but yeah, yeah. I suppose with an advantage like this, it's like the enemy can't stand a chance. You know? Very true. I mean, looking at um, what's going on here, I can't see any way that, you know, bullets could penetrate this. And um, in terms of, well, artillery. I mean, it, it takes time to aim artillery, right? And this is mobile, so. No, God, no! This is uh, this is quite incredible, honestly. You know, snaps a few other pictures. Hey, okay. so in that case, we will take another card and split. I want you to take this one. Right, it's right. -click. Ah, okay. Two of hearts. All right. So hearts, relationships, emotions, connections, so on and so forth. So, uh, what do you have to say to the reporter about this uh, new technology, this thing that you've been well in the proximity of developing, and how that'll help with the war effort? I'm going to appeal to him, as he's seen us in action and use myself as a conduit uh, of hope toward the rest of the project considering using both myself and the lieutenant as a conduit as hope to the rest of the project since we are in the thick of it um yes no um very expertly put Private, I'm rather impressed, actually. This is something that me and the uh, lieutenant over here have been 
very, I'd like to say, excitedly watching over for a long time now. Uh, wouldn't you say, Graham? That certainly feels like a long time, that much is for sure. Right. He showed a bit more enthusiasm, but I'll take what I can get with him. He's always like this. Oh. But, uh, between the engineers, the, the scientists, the mathematicians, I, oh, I can't tell what half of them are talking about half the time, but they always like to tell me things. This could be a shining ray for us, for the Allies, for the, the war effort in, in its entirety. Right. And I mean, it, it is it is you folks, you um, you soldiers on the ground who actually have to use it and deal with it. And no, no, you for sure, you would know above anyone else what is going to work and what isn't. I mean, after all, you know, I haven't been out there, and I honestly haven't oh, heard that come much. On. But uh, remind me, just. I know how it is in the military. Call me Harry. Oh, um, Harry, right, but, Remind um... Remind me your, your first? Oh, uh, Marlon. Marlon Pierce. Marlon. Well, you saw how we all reacted on the front lines already. You know how we work. You know we are damn good at what we do no matter what. Yeah. Up against us. Right. No matter what is up against us, we will succeed. And this is going to make that job ten times easier. Right. I'd um, like to say that the war is already won. Yeah. No, Graham, uh, Graham Snickers. Alright. In that case, I, since more cards were played than there were players, I am going to take the last card. And, you know, since we want to make it a success, if you'll give me a moment. Nervously. We've got the- oh, sorry, uh, I messed that up. Wrong card. We've got the King of Diamonds, actually, and that represents the self. So ambition, slash hope, slash all that sort of thing, all that forward thinking, and, um... Marlon Pierce sort of hearing all of your appeals, and even despite, you know, experiencing those corpse feeders the other day, he he looks fairly confident. He looks, you know, reassured, and just the example of this massive, you know, vehicle before him, the, you know, the, the, the massive gun turret, the armor plating, the, ca the caterpillar treads, everything, he just sort of, no, no, I... Honestly, this is... I never could have imagined something like this. I... It, it's like you said, it makes perfect sense. It... I mean, from what I've heard, and like I said, I haven't heard all too much in terms of detail. The folks that I've spoken with have been kind of, um, reticent to speak much about it, but, um... Considering the conditions, no. This would be the perfect thing to punch through the enemy lines. I... No, it's it's exceptional, and he sort of like snaps a few pictures here and there, sort of going around it, and just um. So, uh, was there just gonna be a tour, or was there gonna be a demonstration as well? Now that might be in charge. That's up to the spirit officer now, isn't it? And he looks over to the lieutenant. Or lieutenant. Uh, would that be okay? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. That would be cool. okay. I think also, uh, Xander, you can take that card. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, you get, you do get one back. Nice. I think we can certainly arrange that. Right. No. Um, perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, so, um, and so you did succeed on the mission, uh, on the journey, rather, so that is 
very nice and very good. So that means you don't necessarily take as many drawbacks. But uh, as you sort of go through the paces and both you, Lieutenant, and you, Lance Corporal, you all have done, you know, some of the demonstrations before. You've done some testing in, you know, on behalf of the, the scientists, the mechanics, the engineers, and so on and so forth. So uh, you sort of um, take your positions, you sort of, uh, you know, nudge the private into the correct places, and you start putting it into its paces. Uh, you, you start putting it through its paces, and... Um, you know, Pierce, who has kind of climbed into the stuffy interior with you to get a closer view at everything, is in suitable awe. Now, it's hot, it's gross, it smells like petrol and metal and gunpowder, but damned if it isn't fucking working, right? So, yeah. <laughs> ah... The smell is success. <laughs> God, is it? <clears throat> Does success always smell like this? Oh, uh, yes. Gavin on the top of lubricant. Right. Take it in, Alan. Take it in. This is the smell of victory. No, absolutely. And, he, and he's sort of like peers through one of the uh, sort of like portholes in the side of it. No, God, this thing is a fortress. It's practically impenetrable. And, um... So, as you guys put the tank through its paces, you know, you roll it around, you show off its maneuverability, you sort of roll it through. There's kind of an impromptu test course that's been built into the landscape, you know, some sort of pseudo-trenches dug around and something like that. But, um, it's kind of... You know, it, it, it's kind of like started to stall a little bit. And those of you driving, something seems not quite right. The entire project has, has felt like there have been things going wrong one after the other. But this, this is kind of the icing on the cake. And you're kind of worried that, um, well, in between what you discovered yesterday and then the sudden technical difficulties as the tank grinds to a screeching mechanical halt. The traitor's probably been here, uh, and they've probably been at work for a while, and, uh, well, yeah. Yes, Private? Uh, sorry, sorry, he was just gonna react to this whole thing. Uh, so, sir, Sir Morose, is this supposed to- is that supposed to happen? Ah, uh, no, but this is still a work in progress. It's not finished. There's a few kinks that need to be worked out, of course. That's why the project is secret. Uh, uh, right, I see. I, ho hopefully it can be figured out soon, right? Right, and um, time. the... Harry, uh, you know, glances back at both the reporter and the private as he's talking to them, and then as he's, yeah, right, yeah, looks over to the lieutenant ahead of, like, just next to him, if not ahead of him, would have look of concern. Just kind of asking, is like, this is good, right? This is fine. <laughs> Almost looking for reassurance. Well, Lieutenant? Uh, sorry, my internet cut out very briefly. That was inconvenient. I lost a little bit of audio. What'd you ask me? Oh, word. Uh, after he, after Harry responds to uh, the private behind him, looks towards the Lieutenant let's say ahead of him mm. with a look of concern like this is fine right is it fine jam um well lieutenant things were actually going smoother uh before 
you left for your leave. That's kind of the reason why a reporter was invited I... to take a look at it. So the fact that it's being messed up right now means that whatever mole or whatever traitor uh, has been passing secrets off to the enemy has been... Yeah, exactly. No... No, as in Lance Corporal. All right. Well, uh, I, I'm sure this is easily workable. <laughs> um, it's wartime, after all. Those uh, science lads certainly, uh, you know how the machines, you know how they make them back in America. Sometimes they work, and then sometimes you got to give them a good thumping. Ah, uh, those pencil pushers, they don't know how, what they're doing half the time. Uh, well, I trust the engineers more than anything else. I think, uh, they're, I think they're taking one too many bad habits from the Americans, to be honest. Exactly. That's what I like to hear. No uh, offense, McKinley. Speaking no, of, Mc take McKinley, um, do you know anything <laughs> about machinery? Well, I, I, I think I might. Maybe just a little bit. Just a little bit? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I tinkered with, uh, with, um, m machinery with, with my father back in the day. Oh, well, you, you probably know more than me. Guts are all around you if you want to take a look. I might as well, I suppose. Hey, um, open it there. Yep, he just yep. kind of looks around. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, McKinley, how about uh, you, you can sort of take a look at the wiring, the mechanics of the tank, and I want to have a target number of three successes on a mechanics roll, if you don't mind. It, it is complex, and you haven't seen anything like this before, but, um, you know, you think maybe you can catch a look at it, maybe see what could be going wrong. Yeah. Also, he, he's motivated to to impress his superiors and show that he can do a good job. So let's he's not one of those damn Americans. <laughs> oh boy! Basically, he wants to prove him wrong. <laughs> all right. So we're gonna roll and just go all in. Okay. He wants all to try in. his let's hardest. Go. Two successes, and I asked for three, didn't I? Three. I believe yeah. you asked for three. Okay, hey, so that's one, and you used all four. Unfortunate. So you don't really have anything. You could, you uh, do have cards. You could burn a card if you would like to uh, bump up one at that, you know, that four to a five and make it a success. If you'd like. You don't have to. Let's see. Let's go ahead and burn one of those cards. All right, slap it up and uh, I will take care of that for you. Mm. Excellent. Well. We wanna know what's wrong with this thing. Yeah, so um, I will say, Private McKinley, you, you, sort of, you sort of look over the mechanics of the tank and you look over the wiring and as you sort of look through what could possibly going be going wrong, you really buckle down, you really try to look into it, and based on the suit of the card that you burned, what do you lose? Hmm. Part of yourself is no longer there. What do you give up? Oh, that's a fucking hard question, Jesus. Ooh. Yeah, that's what it- fuck that. <laughs> Y'all are be... so a memory, it could be, you know, an emotion, it could be any number of things, but you do need to give something up. When you burn a card, a sacrifice must be made, equal exchange. He forgets a very pivotal memory where he went out with some schoolboy friends of his and on that day he learned a valuable lesson to respect authority despite <laughs> having gone on an adventure mm -hmm. and learning that lesson after breaking the rules okay. and okay. so he has lost a part of himself 
that respects authority. He has plenty of other situations where he has, but it's not as strong as it was before. Okay. Thank you, Private McKinley. And so that's very good. Fuck. As as you look through the the mechanics of the tank, you you finally spot it. You sort of squint through the nests of wires and so on, and you you see it. It's just a little connection that is just a little out of place. Honestly, it could have gone completely unnoticed. Almost like it could have been jostled out by accident. But sure enough, as you nudge it back onto its connector and you signal for the others to start the tank going again, it roars back to life with no issue. All right, private! Ha <laughs> ha! We got it fixed in and just needed, it, like I said, good thumping. I think I see, you, you were much. spouting doubts about those Americans. Never said doubts about the Americans. I said they were picking up bad habits from the Americans. Aha! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that well, smells no like victory. There's no bad habits in this one. <laughs> uh, there's not, la. Uh, there's not. Oh, you still got your flask on you? Of course, of course. You still left oh. a little whiskey for me, so therefore I do. Well, I think the private has earned a little reward, don't you? Well, hair of the dog. Hey, now you get him. Pass my flask over to McKinley. And thank you, sir. Having no idea of the terrible turmoil that you've just put inside this child. <laughs> no idea of the horrifying. <laughs> God. Listen, sometimes the overall the goal idea. is far more important. So he ta he takes the um he takes the flask. He seems a little bit more confident than usual, but it's it's a little it's a little misplaced. Mm. P people wouldn't really notice unless they were a little bit more familiar with McKinley and how he he tends to be a little bit more shy or or reserved uh, around authorities. But you know who knows. Are are we one uh, uh, DM? I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you since we're on stream. Are, would you rather us keep stats that haven't been said to ourselves, or do you care if we fucking spout? I mean, it's uh, mostly up to you. Like phys physical, like your attributes would be pretty obvious character wise to other characters. But um, in terms of what cards you have in your hand, you keep that to yourself cards obviously uh i i meant more you know numbered stats and all that but i <laughs> wouldn't notice guts of five guts of four <laughs> yeah no bo both of you definitely would be able to pick up on a huh, huh. kids got a Fucking... kids got a thing going on Everyone, Morose, could, uh, everyone could use a healthy little bit of insubordination every now and again. Oh, uh, well, I, I I take myself, um... Uh... Well, actually, Lieutenant, uh, I, I'm gonna ask you specifically. How much insubordination do you think I take? S sorry, sir? <laughs> He hasn't responded. I think that's well enough alone. So, sorry, sir. Hmm? Sure, back to the machine and the photographs. Um, so back to the machine and the photographs. Um, the, right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and you know, the the, the reporter Pierce looks ha, has looked suitably impressed by the uh, quick thinking of the private and getting everything you know back and working, but. That doesn't change the fact that you, Second Lieutenant Faulkner, and honestly, the rest of you at this point, somebody is feeding information right. to the enemy, and you are the only ones who know that that's happening, so it is up to you to try and figure out who is doing that and who could be the mole. GM, mm -hmm. I have a question. 
Are there any animals around? Hmm. That is a good question. Let me... You know what? Fuck it. We'll do a little thing. Yeah, there are uh there are a few. The the thing about, you know, the French countryside and being close to the uh well, closer to the front than, you know, perhaps you would rather be is that god you can't escape rats. Rats are fucking everywhere. The fucking vermin crawl around, always starving, always looking for food and, you know, all sorts of other little opportunities. So, yeah, there are animals around. There are, there are a few rats and rodents that you've seen scurrying around the uh, sort of living areas and the, uh, you know, cook the, the, the mess areas and so on and so forth. Um, Graham kind of like notices the rats, kind of like looks at them, looks back at the group, you know, sticking around in his mouth, <laughs> takes an inhale, exhales it, you know, out into the air, uh, looks over at Morose and just kind of like walks over to the group and says, uh, McKinley Morose, uh, got some, uh, help, uh, the airport, so just get some nice shots of this, uh, I'm gonna take a wee little smoke break, uh, just, uh, need a minute, uh, <laughs> It just exhales and like walks away out of sight as best as he can get while they're yes split. Before he goes, uh, Moreau's responds, "Right, shall I join you, or is this one of those need some alone time situations?" Yeah, I'd prefer if I had a little moment of privacy to, uh, you know, shake right, his right, junk. Right. He shakes his junk a little bit, you know. <laughs> do what you need to do. Mm gonna walk out of sight where there's still rats um kind of like look over his shoulder and take another draw from a cigarette he's gonna roll up his like left sleeve a bit where he has a bunch of really fucking weird tattoos and scars in his left forearm like i'm talking like pagan celtic tattoos mm -hmm. um and he's just gonna like take out his army issue knife and just kind of like um just drags it across the back of his arm, lets some blood drip into the dirt. Um, starts humming real low to himself, like real low and quiet, like intonations. Uh, and then grabs like a stick off the ground, I'd say, and begins like drawing what, like just like these like Celtic pagan glyphs into the dirt while humming, uh, while looking at one of the rats he sees, like looking at dead in the eyes. Um, and singing like low and throaty you know through closed lips and through a humming this like it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, it's like it's like, like i said it's like a gaelic um like uh, like ancient old tune older than like the kings of england itself you know uh and i would like to uh cast befriend excellent roll me uh, a smarts roll please i will and i can add bonuses to this if i so choose yeah, so you have your one die. I have, with I, a I have three smarts. And then so... three smarts. Okay, and, and, I, and I just need one success? Yes. Okay, I'm going to roll. I'm going to buy two more dice. I'll roll three d6s. Okay. And I'm going to spend my last success to make that one, four, a five. All right, perfect. So that is a success. As you, you know, start your rich ritual i don't know what else to call it as you start the humming those you know th those tones those tunes that have sort of been passed down to you that you've learned uh one of the one of the one of the vermin that you noticed sort of like stops and perks up a little bit and it very cautiously kind of scampers and advances towards you and it stops at the very edge of where you've drawn your runes and it sort of tilts its head and th this rat it's a trench rat and you've seen trench rats mm. it's it's fat it's fur is sleek and you know that this this rat's been feeding on human corpses but nevertheless it sort of perches up on its haunches and it looks straight up at you with its beady little eyes and it waits 
Yeah, um, Faulkner kind of like squats down and looks at this rat in the eye. It's just kind of <laughs> takes a draw from his, his cigarette, blows it, and just kind of like looks and just gives the rat a little nod while looking in the eyes and says, uh, he's going to speak in the old tongue. Okay. Like the, like the language of like the pagan druids of old, you know, uh, and just kind of say to it, good day to you, lad. No. They're going to do me a wee bit of a favor. I want you to hang around this little big metal loud machine. And if anyone, anyone at all, comes around and starts to... You know, I'm, I'm vocalizing as the way that we humans understand. Yeah. But the intention... Um, I'm, I'm, the, the intention's coming off as a way a rat might understand. Mm-hmm. Basically, I'm saying, if anyone books this machine... If anyone tries to sabotage it, if people just walk by looking at it, using it, great. But if people are trying to sabotage this thing, I want you to scamper, and I want you to fucking rip into their flesh like you are starving. I want you to dig into them as hard as you can. Go for the foot. Go for their fucking dick for all I care. Just fucking hurt them and hurt them good. You understand me, laddie? The rat sort of like tilts its head a little bit and it sort of like uh, it wiggles its nose, it flicks an ear and it almost nods, but then it turns tail and scampers back off into the tall grass. Yeah, so I am basically just setting this rat up too. If anyone does try to sabotage this thing, I want this rat to go buck wild on it. So we... So, and, you know, I'll pass along, I'm going to pass along a message to the infirmary. like, hey, if we get anyone in for a severe rat bite, arrest them. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, all right. No, uh, uh, and, yeah, one see. of the, yeah, one of the so lower we, COs sort of like, okay, sure, mm, all right, fine. Uh, uh, anyway, so, like, yeah, so, basically, um, animal, I, this animal is, I, it follows my commands, if able. Um, there's a number of like things like at the end of the ritual here that I'm curious about. It's like it's just like plus one animal parentheses one plus one corrupted beast parentheses three command plus one animal. Like what are, what do all those numbers mean? Yeah, uh, those are uh, so you get additional effects based on the number of successes. Gotcha. That you yeah. Get. Cool. 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 So I only got so, the one. So I only got like correct. yeah. Cool. Good to know. Cool. Well then, that's what he does. Does that real quick. Draws from a cigarette. Crushes it under heel. Walks back to the group and he mim- he pantomimes like he's just zipping his the front of his pants again. The front of his pants that he doesn't have. Oh, that's right. There's no zipper in them. Buttons. <laughs> you, you got buttons, kilt. dude. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you don't a need kilt. buttons. It's a fucking kill. You just kilt. lower it. <laughs> Fine. Then he pantomimes like he's hiking and lowering everything back because he is wearing underwear. So it's like he he pantomimes like he's readjusting after. You know, he using... comes back just pan- like patting off his kilt. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you can't get, you can't get drops on the plaid. I would certainly hope not. Hey. So, Marlin, fairly impressed. Did you get enough fo- photographs? No. Um. Yes. Absolutely. Actually. Uh. One more, one more for the presses, if you don't mind. If you all could. Uh, sure. And, and Mar- Marlin sort of like organizes you all so like you know one of you is sort of like like the heads out of the porthole one of you is sort of like on the caterpillar treads the other sort of like posing next to the tank so there's like a big there's there's like a you know plateau of you guys you know kind of size comparison yeah Faulkner is the one next to the tank uh just kind of like just like arms folded smoking before the photo second though he like he like you know pulls the cigarette out and gives a very sharp whistle no one else will notice the fact that there is now a rat, a, a rat in the photograph as well on the machine. Just kind of, but just kind of like brings the, like just gives a sharp whistle and then just puts the cigarette back in his mouth uh, and then just holds his arm and looks at the camera. I'll, I'll go ahead and claim being by the uh, by the treads, you know, one foot up on it, just doing that that classic fucking posing for a photo kind of shit. Charles doesn't know what to do with himself, so he just kind of stands kind of in the middle of the the two of them, just somewhere, just awkwardly stiff. (laughs) Oh, you're going to be out the porthole. Oh, boy. (laughs) (laughs) 
Greenhorn takes the porthole. That's just part of the rules. <laughs> oh, the um, rules that I just made up right now. Right, right. Um, well, in that case, and you know, Pierce sort of like kneels down, steadies himself, lifts the camera up, and you know, takes a number of quick shots. And yes, indeed, Second Lieutenant Faulkner, there is a small rat kind of like in the in the treads of the caterpillar. It, it's not very noticeable, but. When the film is developed, you could ac absolutely see it when you take a look. So, yeah, excellent. The uh, the demonstration actually went fairly well. Uh, the the tank was well represented to our reporter friend, and as you head back, and you you sort of you sort of take the tank back, you put it through some other paces, and as you head back to sort of get it back into the the, the corral, the garage of the warehouse, um, you know, uh, some some engineers come out. They they talk to you. They you know get an estimation of how they think the uh, the thing went, and um, it, it's taken most of the day. So it's about evening at this point. And, uh, you know, most people, they're either, they've either, you know, gone to do their duties or standing sentry. And you all, since you've been escorting the reporter, you've kind of been in his retinue. But you hear, as you all are in the barracks and where people have been sleeping and resting, you hear just this piercing shriek of a person. And it sounds like, God, it almost sounds like they've had their unmentionables bitten by a trench rat. Yikes. And, you know, I think at this point, it's a good time to end the session. There is a traitor in your midst, and what you want to do with and him? And he lost well... his fucking dick. <laughs> no, no. He just lost his fucking dick. <laughs> he got his fucking manhood chewed off by a trench rat <laughs> because you fucked with the wrong army, mate. <laughs> Get out, <laughs> Miss Swamp! <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, best Bye way to end queen. a session. <laughs> God bless the queen and her fucking colonizers. <laughs> God bless them. Right. I am one of those colonizers, so thank you for the blessing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and uh, with <laughs> that, excellent. and uh, with the knowledge that we have found the traitor, well, what we're going to do with him and the way you want to deal with this, you know, PR thing is something that will happen next session. So for now, we're going to go take a quick break, and then we'll come back and we'll take some questions from the audience. So stay tuned in, and we can talk about never going home. So... See you in a little bit. <laughs>